Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Pokemon Legends Arceus. We're going to be doing the other half of the uh, main area, so Growlithe is ready to evolve because we have a Firestone. Huzzah! I forget. <laughs> how hard is it to find stones in this game? Um, oh, no, there's a place you can buy them. Right. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying. I'm curious to see what, like, what was the visual inf in in inspiration for the Hisuian Growlithe line? Um, it certainly looks like something that would be on an old Japanese, like, um, tapestry. It kind of reminds me of some stuff I've seen in Shin Megami Tensei, to be honest. Um, yeah. Oh. <laughs> away you go. <laughs> yeah. Evolve it for the Pokedex. Never use it again. That. Yep. Sounds yep, about. Basically. Sounds about right. Oh man. I like this area. I think this area is where the game really. Um, starts to come into its own um it's like one of the better water areas actually too as well because there's a lot of stuff to do on the water too like there's a lot of tiny islands to explore and like rock formations with stuff on them and all sorts of stuff i think that they i think this this level gets a ted thumbs up approval sign thing something to slap on the back of the box ted thumbs up approval ted thumbs approval up sign thing the thumb up a little tattoo of a face of Ted. So far, one thing I will say is that it does look like the game doesn't have quite as much environmental diversity as Scarlet and Violet. N not, I mean, in terms of like the, like, I mean, obviously it's a swamp level, a forest level, a uh, beach level, but like when you turn the, yeah, when you turn the beach off screen, it yeah, looks like it, it looks like area, the yeah. it looks like the forest area. Um, whereas like all the regions of Scarlet and Violet were pretty geographically diverse. Um, I I don't know how much that is them trying to re like base this air these areas off of Sinnoh locations, and how much is this just like a lack of time? Or... Well, I mean, it probably is a bit of a budget thing. To be honest, a lot of expansive RPGs will end up reusing assets over large areas. But, like, even in a Bethesda production, when you play Skyrim, there there are different regions that all have their own u unique look and feel. So, um, I mean, graphics are also clearly not this game's strong suit. And this is, you know, been said about every Pokemon game graphics weren't graphics weren't Scarlet and Violet's strong suit either, but they or did Sword and Shield. <laughs> um, that's what it, that's what Ted's getting at. Like, it's been like the one consistent complaint of Pokemon since it went 3D. Well, not three, not even 3D. I would say HD. Um, I would say well, 3D. Um, <laughs> I mean, I would sort of, um, when it went shield, when it um, went 3D, I think there was a bit of rumbling about X and Y, but Sun and Moon. Sun and, and Moon for the 3DS looked gorgeous. Yeah, um, it basically looked like a handheld PS2 game, which is all anyone ever wanted from a goddamn 3DS game. Um, yeah. Um, and I mean, even in X and Y, the overworld looked kind of, eh, but the Pokemon models all looked. The the, uh, the 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 Alpha the, the Sapphire and Ruby um, remix fared better than X and Y, I think. Um. Um. In most, I mean, <laughs> I, I was gonna say in most cases, there's like a pretty vocal contingent of. Uh, Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire haters. Um, I don't understand why, but you do so, you guys. So, um, <laughs> as someone who doesn't have a horse in this race, my best understanding of their argument, and I could be wrong, so I'm, I'm going to take as much uh, responsibility off of my words as possible here. Um, a lot of people were upset about the content from Emeralds that didn't make it into the game. Like, the Battle Frontier was apparently scaled down significantly was one thing people were upset about. Right. The okay, that sort of content I can understand because that's like you know modes and stuff that could be transplanted into the game regardless of emerald context. But I'm yeah, also like I like, don't think anybody was mad about like that the story wasn't exactly like emeralds because honestly I think that okay so Gen three story is bad no matter how you slice it it's just, it's just not very good but the idea that oh which team's the good guy and which team's the bad guy is different on which cartridge is interesting at least and uh Gen three just kind of makes them both assholes which I suppose is more accurate but it's not as engaging the the um, thing the thing about emerald though is that it's it, it is that it, it has this weird element of of being not quite a sequel but also a counterpoint to the other two versions like certain characters are in different situations there's a different champion 
and that different champion was a supporting character elsewhere in the game. Oh yeah, that was that was such a weird change. Um, it's that... it's interesting because it's the kind of stuff that banks on you already having played the original version, but it kind of loses its impact if you don't have like like if they were going to remake Emerald version, they would have to remake Emerald version after remaking Ruby and Sapphire for it to work. You that's know? actually that's a good point. I never really thought about because I mean. Yeah, people are sheep and they will buy the same game twice because it's Pokemon. Um, I know, like, I did up through Sun and Moon. Um, like, through Sun and Moon, like, I bought Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, even though I, A, didn't really need to, and B, um, the story mode's worse, so I probably shouldn't have. Anyway. You know, I'll, I'll give the multiple versions thing a bit more of a pass when it's still on a handheld, because having your own version of a game that you can street pass people with and and play random oh, people uh, that oh, you meet so, at a convention or whatever, that's that's fun. I like um, the no, idea. No, I'm more, I'm more mean like the third version. Like oh, yeah. but Crystal, <laughs> yellow. I mean, so here's the thing. Like, back in the era where, like, expansion passes and DLC... Uh, weren't really a thing, you know, having this, like, expansion pack sort of element where it's just, like, you play yellow and it's, like, suddenly, oh, it, it's, like, basically the game got a graphics update, you know, all the Pokemon sprites look really cool and there's this Pikachu and whatnot. Yeah. And Crystal added a whole bunch of um, stuff that, like, honestly, you, you wonder, it's just, like, it was a huge improvement. Like, the, the colors are more varied. There's the, the girl, which mattered a lot to... Um, a huge uh, section of the of the fan base and like the animated sprites and not, not like they were real improvements but um, you know in the Emerald I mean there was added content in Emerald and I think they brought back uh, animated sprites but that was also a thing of like why did they have to bring that back why couldn't the sprites in Gen 3 have just been animated to begin with um, you know yeah <laughs> um, I think Emerald was the first case, yeah, where it felt like, oh, this isn't just the definitive edition of the game. This is a version of the game you would have need to have played the first version for the changes to matter. Yeah. And it's it, it, it kind of rode the line between what we consider modern DLC and an expansion pack, which at the time would have been a retail product on its own. Oh, yeah, that's true. Because, like, at the time, if you bought, like, the StarCraft expansion pack, that's like a thirty dollar disc, that does nothing if you didn't already own StarCraft. Yeah, uh, StarCraft, Baldur's Gate, and Neverwinter Nights, the Elder Scrolls games. They used to sell stuff like fucking Shivering Isles in stores on the shelves as a separate disc. Believe it or not, if you were ever if you were ever into stuff like Duke Nukem or Doom, there were so many like unofficial expansions where people <laughs> were effectively selling their own fan games. Uh, using the <laughs> engine, um, and you could just buy them. Uh, yeah, and like e hell, even fucking Tomb Raider got in on the fun. Um, on PC they had those anyway. For Tomb Raider too. Yeah, on PC only though. The PS One versions didn't that makes sense. didn't get these, but there are these whole massive level packs for the old Tomb Raider games that really test skilled players. Um, with some with some devious level designs. You you don't you don't even get them on Steam if you get the Steam version. You have to go and hunt them hunt them down online now nowadays. Were but they, they are really official good. or were they're, they? The, oh, they were official. They were official. Huh. Uh, although there there is there are level packs. There are level builder tools available to fans officially. So there are a lot of fan made level packs as well. But um, the actual like level packs I'm talking about, which are th I think they're called unfinished business, are like uh, their own level packs. Sort of like as expansion packs to the official game. It's fun shit. I recommend like if you ever get into classic Tomb Raider, look that shit up. You will not be disappointed. Man, there's just I don't know if I'd ever if like I'm, I'm ever gonna have the time or interest though, and that's not to be dismissive of your hobbies. Like it's just there's so many different games and stuff. And, like, uh, books I want to read and whatnot. I, I just, I feel like I'm so much more choosy about what I spend my it, time it takes It takes a lot of dedication in here in 2023 to go back to an old-ass tank-controlled platformer like Tomb Raider and actually get dedicated to, to learning how that whole movement system works. Because it goes against the way you, 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 you're, you instinctively try to move in other games, right? 
and you have to dedicate some time to practicing <laughs> and getting a feel for it. Say tank control platformer, and you mentioned Tomb Raider. I don't know why, but my mind just immediately went, yeah, Croc is my favorite baby's first Tomb Raider platformer. It, it kind platformer. of is. That's what the backpack is. Yeah. The backpack is a Tomb Raider reference, <laughs> yeah, you know? The back, yeah, that's right. They're related, don't you but know? But, like, um, it's like there's, there's a lot to getting into Tomb Raider. You have to, like, you have to get a feel for being able to glance at the level and just instantly know, based on the grid-based layout, how far you can jump, you know? Like, how would you recommend folks play the original Tomb Raider nowadays? Like, would you still say like PlayStation One release? No, I would say PS. I was I would say no. PC with some smoothing mods to make it look less ugly. Yeah, because I was like, because Christ, that game is ugly. <laughs> but the ra- but the main reason to play PC is that you can save a- save anywhere. Um, the PS One version had the sort of save yes. crystal system where you would walk into a crystal and you get to save, and each crystal would work exactly one time. Um, oh. So. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> so like if you're if you're willing if if you feel confident about your skills then you might want to play the ps1 version but you know while you're still getting into it the being able to save scum every jump that worries you is is definitely going to help <laughs> uh did the later tomb raider so not like the the reboot or the other reboot but like did like Tomb Raider 2 or 3 or 4 ever make the controls not tank controls, like normal controls? The, the, the Look, the, the game stuck with tank controls all the way up through the core era. The, the, first, the first Tomb Raider to have non-tank controls was the console version of Angel of Darkness, which is not a good game, whether it's tank controlled or not. And actually, the non-tank controlled version of the game is even worse. So, oh. uh... But like, oh, no. if you want a Tomb Raider game that's not the reboot, but also not tank controlled, what you want is the Crystal Dynamics era, um, Legends, Anniversary, and Underworld. But be aware that they 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 do sort of approach platforming and combat in a much different, more uh, PS2 era casualness kind of way. They're good games, but they're not the same kind of game. Is is all I'm saying. Oh, hashtag not my two. Oh, <laughs> this fucking this fucking place. OK, sorry. We're going to talk about the game again. I, I know so what? <laughs> this fucking coastline. I, I hate it. So at the very edge of this coastline is a fucking um, like thing of rocks and not rocks. There's like these two big rock outcroppings that look like like spires coming out. And there's some quest line in this game where it's just like, oh, you have to go through those. And figure out how you're supposed to do that. Um, but you're the only way that you have to have a specific. It's like, oh, but you have to have specific Pokemon with you in order for that to work. And you're like, OK, what the fuck am I supposed to do? Um, there's nothing. The answer in, is in BDSP. Yeah. Yeah. The, the 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 there's nothing in the game that tells you what Pokemon you need to have in your party for it to work. And the only way that you would know is if you read like one easily missable book in one room in uh, the remakes of Diamond and Pearl, um, which is just asinine. Um, it, it's, it's it almost kept me from 100% in the game because I was like, this is fucking stupid. Um, like, and I know that I could have just looked it up <laughs> online. I didn't ha- I, you don't have to buy a Brilliant Diamond or Shining Pearl. Like the game doesn't check your save file. It's just this is information that is in a book in that game that you could look up on a let's play or whatever, but it's just the, the principle of it. It was just like, I look, I get that the, the, the mythology of the early Pokemon and the, you know, Bill's secret garden, hold your game boy upside down, peek a blue nonsense. I get that. That was like a culture aspect of the old Pokemon games way back in the day. Like I get that that's sort of a kind of magic about and part of what made those old games so popular but with that said in the world where information is constantly accessible to everyone those sorts of things those sorts of mysteries don't work um in having convoluted bullshit like this in your game just makes me angry the um, moment someone answers the question on reddit and it becomes readily available by a quick google search the magic it lost yeah you know? <laughs> so it's like um 
<laughs> why like why have and if you don't even like if you're trying to play this game on your own because i don't like looking up things online for games well that's the thing i think i think that's why they keep doing it because you can't assume everybody does yeah that. but that's that that's the thing though i don't like looking stuff up or feeling like oh do i have to look up a guide because that takes me out of the game completely where it's just like i need to look up a guide for this it, it, it's not even just that you can look at a guide or that you will look at a guide but it's like the only reason that stuff worked back in the day was because you would go to school or maybe work if you were old enough and you would talk to people about the game and you would share what you knew and it would be sort of a semi-collaborative mystery you know Nowadays, it's just, you know, you either figure it out on your own, you brute force it, or you look it up on Google. There's just, there is no way to look at the, to figure it out on your own. There's nothing even in this game that I think hints that it's supposed to be in another game. Like, I think the only thing that they say, like, it's an ancient legend or something, if I remember correctly. Um, and it's like, okay, so do I have to, like, talk to other people to figure it out? Do I have to explore and find, like, a, like a hidden book? It's just like you can look up and down in, in this game and there's not even a, a clue to where it's supposed to be or even that you like need to have a specific Pokemon with you. It's just it's something that you never would be able to figure out on your own. And it just irritates the crap out of me because. And I, I, I've said this a couple of times, I think there's very few things in a gaming experience that takes me more out of what i'm doing than feeling like oh god i gotta look it up on a online um because a it's admitting defeat that i'm not good enough to figure it out on my own which i hate doing um and two it's just like i it's it's irritating because i feel like the game would have to be badly designed for me to feel like i needed to do that and b it's just like okay i'm stopping what i'm doing and going on the internet and looking up i'm not in the mindset of playing the game. It just, it irritates me. Stop yeah. doing it. Are we talking just in general, or are we talking about when you're trying to do, like, an optional side content and that um, sort of thing? I would say it's definitely much more irritating when it's mandatory. It's just like, I can't figure out this mandatory yeah. puzzle. But even then, it's just like, the game has to have failed to make me want to look it up online. Because if I'm getting mm. into a game and I'm, like, really in the headspace, I want to figure it out on my own. Um... And so even if it is optional content, the fact that you frustrated me so much to the point where I feel like I need to look it up is a failure to me. And I mean, granted, also, I am dumb. Sometimes I just I sometimes I just I can't figure stuff out and I do need to look it up. But there's also I, I'm also self-aware enough to get to the point where it's just like, OK, this is a me thing. I can't figure this out. Let me look up the answer so I can keep going versus... I guess I'd, I I look at it more of a, a as an ec economical viewpoint where if I got to look it up in a guide, it's just like, hey, whatever, I don't want to waste too much time on this. Yeah. You know, I, I'm genuinely curious to proceed and see how this event unfolds, but I'm not losing too much sleep if I can't figure well, everything out myself. It's not a matter of you not being able to figure it out personally. It's more a matter of if you can tell that in the game's design, there is no way to figure it out. And that you have to look it up. It feels cheap. Well, you should have just bought our other games, idiots. <laughs> the um, it, it's like there's a difference between you voluntarily deciding that you don't want to take the time to do something, and you um not being able to do something no matter how much time it y you put into it. There's also the fact that even if you did buy Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, you have to have found that book in that game. Which you might not have, you know, you might not have <laughs> gone into that building or checked that bookshelf. And then B, you have to remember that that happened because the game came out something like three months before this other one. You know, so you have to remember that random like piece of dialogue that you read four months ago if you're playing this game as intended. <laughs> so, yeah, no, it just sucks. I hate it. Yeah. 